about to leave Already packing, come with me I'm not really asking We'll get away to a place where we don't know About to see the world in action What we can be, life with no distractions We'll get away, this is what we waited for Good afternoon or almost good evening everyone. So let's get the right screen in line in place there. It's Jim here at Tuesday HQ welcoming you to our, I think it's our 12th, our 12th live uh, AQA GCSE Geography Revision Blast. We've been doing these for the last three or four months and they've been great fun. We've covered lots and lots of topics and tonight we've got a second session on changing economic world with a focus on the UK and I'm joined this evening, straight this afternoon, by uh, Suzanne, who's in the middle, and by Vicky on the right-hand side. Good Hi. afternoon, team. <laughs> Looking forward to today. We've got uh, about 30, 35 minutes or so, I guess, if it uh, yep. runs true to, to normal form of uh, a variety of revision tasks uh, on the topic. Quite a few students joining us live on both YouTube as well as Facebook Live. So welcome to you. You're under a bit of time pressure today because uh, we go at quite a pace on the live sessions. But there's an opportunity for you to use the chat window, the live chat in YouTube, or the comments, if you're watching on Facebook Live, to add your suggested answers in. And that's useful for Suzanne and Vicky to see how you're getting on. You don't have to, but don't be shy. Give it a go. If you're watching on replay or catch up, of course, you can give yourself a bit more time, pause the video, and maybe have a think uh, about what the answers might be to each of the activities. But hopefully you find it useful. Uh, who wants to lead us off? I think we've got like a really teasing altered vowels activity first is that yeah. right vicky is we that? have we're yeah. we're fairly jam-packed so we've got altered vowels which is a really good favorite game i enjoy that one we've got chain of analysis we've got mcqs we've got red herrings so we've got some of the favorites um, Fantastic this stuff. afternoon oh altered vowels is my favorite because uh, you get to read them out don't you suzanne so yeah. uh... <laughs> 
<laughs> Good luck now. Well, all the best to everyone who's joining us live and, of course, on Catch Up and Replay. We'll be quite fast-paced, so uh, if you're going to add Yay. your entries into the chat, please do it quickly. We'll be looking out for answers, but we won't be hanging around. So all the best. Enjoy the session. Uh, right, okay. So, as we said, Altered Vows. The idea of this game, those of you who haven't played it, is that there are some key phrases, some key geographical phrases that are shown, but each of the vowels in the word have been altered to a different alternative vowel. So you've got to look at the word and work out what you think that key geographical phrase is. So, Jim, let's go with the first one, please. Right. So have a good look. Remember, it's the vowels that have been altered. So see what you can think this one is. And if you are playing live pop it in the live chat if you're playing at home on catch up then just pop down your answer let's see if we've got anyone who's going to kick us off this afternoon be the first who can get something down remember it's to do with the uk and the economic world so let's see if we can have any guesses okay let's give us give us the first answer please jim Okay, so this keyword is deindustrialization. Really, really important in this part of the syllabus. It's the decreasing proportion of manufacturing industry taking place in a country. Um, it's much more pronounced in traditional industries, so things like shipbuilding and textiles. And in northern cities in the UK, they suffered so much more from deindustrialization in comparison to the south and the southeast, which have tended to have more of a range of different industries. Some of some of the causal factors for deindustrialization have been that we've actually run out of some of the raw materials that we needed to make some of the things that we were manufacturing. We also suffered because of cheaper imports from abroad. So some of those newly emerging economies that you might have studied can actually make it cheaper than we can because they have much lower wages. We also have changes in demand. So actually we want different things. And also lots of those industries introduced mechanization and automation and computers. So it actually meant there were less people needed to do the jobs in the factories. So really important word to remember for this part of the syllabus, deindustrialization. It kind of overhangs everything. Right, next one. Go uh, can you pop down, please, into the chat if you uh, know the answer? Um, what do you think this one is? Remember, it's the vowels that have been altered. Right. Let's see, Jim. OK, another important one, globalisation. So this is a process which has increased our connectivity across the globe. Now, you might have looked at the flows of money, flows of goods and products through trade, flows of people through migration and lots of flows of information and technology, which, of course, is greatly enhanced by our Internet. And we're doing that today flows of information right uh can i have the third altered vowel one please this is our final one so what do you reckon this might be see if you can pop in to the chat function i can see some of you have started adding your um comments and it's great to see some correct answers no i wasn't going to read this one out <laughs> <I didn't. laughs> I can see you to see you. No, I'm not oh, going to pronounce that one. Go on, okay. Suzanne. You know you want to. I think we should get Catherine to read it. Catherine's joined us, so we'll get Catherine to read it out at the next session. Right. Okay. I've got, well done. I can see Madison and Laurie got this one without um, including the uh, rather rude start to that word. Right. Let's have a go, please. Can we see the answer? Okay, brilliant. Post-industrial economy. Who knew geography could create rude words with altered vowels? Um, the UK has got a post-industrial economy. So this is where our traditional jobs have declined. So as I mentioned before, some of those um, manufacturing jobs in the traditional sectors. But we've seen a growth in service industries. So lots of tertiary industries like healthcare, IT support, tourism. You might know people who are employed in those kinds of industries. And we've now got more and more jobs in financial services so insurance banking and pensions and as well as the growing science and research sector and that might be something that 
some of you might be interested in in the future thinking about your career options they're the growth industries the geographers should know where to end up right i am going to hand over to vicky for the next activity breaking Thank news you. though before you do that suzanne breaking news okay. uh, delighted to <laughs> hot foot from her latest lesson <laughs> catherine has joined us in the top right i just wanted to Hi, welcome catherine. everyone to catherine <laughs> sorry sorry guys the traffic was terrible so i was just rushing in but i'm here Yay! catherine do you want to go back on that last altered vowels and do post-industrial economy or should we move on to the next session i think it was definitely pieced Peaced. that we were looking at oh, there peaced. <laughs> <laughs> they were skiing rather than anything else. Great to see. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wow. Well, well, I think it's. Oh, uh, Vicky, are you next? Yep. That is stuff. me next. Yep. Okay. Super. So we are going to do a chains of analysis activity for our next um, for our next activity. So we've looked at these before. We've done these in the last couple of weeks, in fact. So Jim, if you, you can get the next slide up for us, please. Perfect. So we would like to uh, form a chain of analysis here, looking at, uh, we were looking for a description really of how the UK has moved in terms of its economic base. So we have five statements on the screen in front of you. You have got to rearrange those to form a chain of analysis from what the UK started out in terms of its economy to what it is like now and all the stages that have happened in between. So obviously you do not need to type the entire thing into the chat window, but you just need to reorder these. So we've got, uh, you know, look out for key phrases like you've got the industrial revolution sticking out there. You've got some stuff about uh, the employment structure. There's a mention of post post-industrial economy. So we're going to give you a few moments to have a look at these and try and get them into some sort of, uh, sort of sensible, logical order as to how the UK's economy has changed over the last few hundred years. So have a think about what order you think they might go in. Okay, is there anything that's jumping out that makes you think that should be the one that kicks the whole thing off? Okay. So we can type the numbers in and these are really, really good, these activities in getting you to think about developing those longer answer questions. And obviously with your chains of analysis, you can put things like this leads to or then this happened, etc. So it's quite a good one to, to use here. So I'm going to give you a couple more minutes. Obviously, if you're watching, sorry, not a couple more minutes, a couple more moments. If you are watching later at home, you can pause the video and give yourself a little bit more time if you need it. Okay, with some good answers coming through here in the chat window. So what are we thinking? Where are we starting? So maybe Britain's economy began is probably a good place to start. That sounds a pretty sensible, obvious choice. Okay. Excellent. We've got some good answers coming through already. So we've got a few couple of uh, answers that don't actually agree. So that's a you know quite interesting. So a couple of people here thinking that we're starting on number three, probably not starting on number three. Maybe think about where that is more likely to go. OK, so we've given you quite a bit of time there. We appreciate there's quite a lot for you to read on the screen. Uh, Jim, can we have them in the right order, please? Perfect. So we're starting at the top five, two, one, four, three. Well done for those of you that got that correct. If you got that correct in the chat window, if you got it correct at home, well done. So Britain's economy began with a focus on primary industries such as farming, fishing and quarrying. And most people lived in rural areas. So remember, primary industries involve extracting raw materials and it counts for a really, really small section of the UK economy now. Uh, also, forestry would be included in there as well. So number two, the Industrial Revolution led to goods being produced more rapidly in factories and UK uh, towns grew and some of those became cities. So think about the, the Industrial Revolution. Those historians amongst you will hopefully know that that happened in the 1800s and it led to a big increase in rural to urban migration. Obviously, urbanisation was triggered there and those jobs were seen as uh, better paid and a bit more reliable than those previous farming jobs. OK, number one, when raw materials began to run short with competition from other places, the government decided to rationalise the traditional industry base. Many mines 
factories and docks were closed. This was a huge thing in the 1980s in particular. The idea of deindustrialization that hopefully you, you are quite familiar with had a devastating impact on lots of those really industrial areas. So, for example, the northeast of England, um, South Wales, it had a big multiplier effect, it's like a negative multiplier. So number four, the employment structure changed as secondary industries declined and more people were employed in tertiary and quaternary industries, sometimes working in science and business parts. So tertiary industries, those service industries, quaternary research and development. So these often have really good links with uh, prestigious universities. For example, um, the Cambridge Science Park is um, obviously really close to Cambridge University. It's often referred to as Silicon Fen. And there's a an M4 corridor, including Oxford, which is really heavily linked again between the science park and the university and then right at the bottom the UK is sometimes described as having a post-industrial economy suggesting that it is now focused on IT finance services and research so these are all really highly skilled areas most of them are pretty well paid jobs so we might think about um, like London Docklands for example the big shift from those of uh, the big docks right now to a really like a huge area of finance okay and that idea of moving away from secondary secondary accounts for less than 20 percent of industry in our country nowadays. Rod done some really, really, really good answers coming through there. And remember what we said, that these chains of analysis are really good for developing your longer answer questions. So there's six markers and those nine markers. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Catherine now for a red herring activity. Brilliant. And um, lovely to see in that last activity, the um, links being made there between geography and history, because um, sometimes people say, like, you know, your department's in competition, but no, you know, there's so many interlinks. Um, you know, if you do both geography and history, the two subjects complement each other so well. So let's have a little think then a little bit more about um, some of these key terms and concepts that are part of this changing economic world topic. So we've got here a red herring activity. And so what I would like you to think about is when you look at those different um, words there, three of them go together and one is an odd one out. So could you please in the chat, could you write down which one you think is the odd one out and why? So we got pottery, steelworks, coal mines and information technology. So a nice, easy one to get you started. So which is the odd one out and why? Have a little think as well about the um, think about the, you know, the terminology you use when you're giving a reason why. So, yes, yeah, so lots of people are putting um, good ideas there saying which one it is in the chat, which is brilliant. Well done. Could you tell me why, though? What is the difference between um, the ones that go together and the one that is separate? And like as I say, see if you can think about, you know, what would be good terminology to use? What is it that links pottery, steelworks, coal mines? And what is it we might talk about with information technology? Let's see what your thinking is. Think back to in the last activity, some of the terminology that was used there would be useful. Right, OK, should we have the reveal and see? Right, OK, so in the last activity, um, we had um, the term traditional industrial base used and pottery, steelworks, coal mines would all be very much something we'd associate with that traditional industrial base that we had in the past in the UK. But nowadays, we don't have that traditional industrial base anymore for the reasons um, that were in the last activity but we do have a massive growth in information technology so on the next one let's have a little thing so let's see the next one now um so again let's have a little look and see what we've got here um which ones of these go together and which is our red herring the odd one out so i'd like to know which one is the red herring but also can you tell me um why what is there that links the three that go together and why is one of them a uh, odd one out, a red herring? So let's see if we got some. Um, have we got someone writing down there, different couple ones. Brilliant. So we've got lots of people there saying the red herring. But what I'd like to know now is why is that the odd one out? So what is it that links all the others together? And think about that terminology that you are using. OK, so lots of people have said C, but what is there that links all of um, the other ones together? Uh, anybody going to go for that slightly more complex one? 
easier to say which the odd one out, slightly more challenging to say why. Okay, let's reveal that answer and see. Right, okay, so we've got three of those jobs that uh, are in the information technology industry, um, but generating electricity is not. So we've got our red herring there, our odd one out, and we've also got our reason for it. Okay, let's try number three. Right, again, this links into um, one of previous activities. So think a little bit about these um, different terms that we have here. We've got A, large distribution centres, B, university link, C, focus on research and development, and D, offices and laboratories. So which of these do you think is the red herring, which is the one that doesn't fit, the odd one out? And why is it? I'd really like to see some suggestions coming through in the chat box. We've got loads of you that are saying which one the red herring is, but I'd really like to see a suggestion of what, thinking about what it is that links the um, that links the different points together. I think you're finding this one trickier. Have a little think here about what it could be talking about. Oh, very good. Okay, I really like that answer there. That's fantastic. Let's reveal because we've got someone there that's absolutely spot on. Right, okay, so yes, it was A was the odd one out, large distribution centres. The other characteristics are science parks. Um, so science parks, as was mentioned earlier, like Cambridge Science Park, Oxford's got a science park as well. Um, they have university links, they focus on research and development, and they would have a combination of offices and laboratories. Now, if you had a business park, you might see that there's large distrib distribution centers. So there might be an Amazon distribution center or an Argos, or you know other brands are available. Um, but you don't get that on a science park, that would be a business park. So this is looking at the similarities and differences between those two. So well done, let's go on to number four. Right, okay, so we've got here um, university link, offices and finance, large distribution centres, hotels, cafes and other services. So this should be dead easy after the last one. So let's see lots of people having a go, thinking which is the odd one out here and what links the others. So this should be a nice easy one now. Okay, so we've got we've got a suggestion for the um, for the red herring. Yeah, excellent. Okay, and why? What links the other ones? So we've got university link being the red herring, but what links the other ones? Right, let's have the reveal. Okay, so this was turning it the other way around. So this is thinking about business parks. So with business parks, we tend to have offices, often a lot of um, institutions related to finance. We might have large distribution centres. And also business parks, you often have um, things like hotels, cafes and other services, which um, are there to basically service the other facilities in the business park. So if somebody is coming down to work at an office, they might stay overnight in one of the hotels that there as well. So for example, Aztec West on the edge of Bristol um, is a business park with these different things. But a business park does not necessarily have particularly close links with the university. Science parks are the ones that have that close university link. Okay, let's go on to number five. Right, okay, so again, we've got um, which of the four items is the odd one out and why? So we've got large sites, edge of town, city centre, easy access to transportation. So what would you say is the red herring? Which one is the red herring and why? I think you're going to find the um, red herring very easily, but I'd love it if you could also give me that reason. So let's see. Yeah, it's um, you're doing well there already. We're finding the red herring. Can you tell me why? What might be something that um, links the other three? Let's see. We've had some superstars doing brilliant answers. So let's see what we've got for this one. OK, should we reveal the answer? Right, so the, the city centre is the odd one out there. And what is linking those? Again, we're looking back at those science and business parks. Um, they need to have large sites. Um, so they are often located on the edge of town where they've got that space. If they were in the city centre, they would be, you know, there wouldn't be enough space for them to have their large buildings. Um, and also, 
being on the edge of town, they have easy access to transportation. Um, they're normally by motorway junctions. Um, they may also be near um, to railway lines. They might even be near to local airports. So we've got all those different features tend to be related to science and business parks, whereas city centre locations, that's where maybe in the past we had industry, when we have the traditional industry base, quite often the things like steelworks quite close to the city centre because the city's developed around that traditional industry base. But nowadays we see a lot of industrial development on the edges. Thank you very much. That's um, the red herring activity. Okay, so is that over to um, Suzanne now? Um, I haven't got it down as me, but yeah, I'm happy I'm, to do it. <laughs> is it Vicky? No, I haven't got this one down either. <laughs> oh, well, shall I do this one? If it's not yeah, down sorry, the list, yeah. I'm, I'd, I'd love to do this one as well. Um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, so, yeah, it must have not been on the list. I'm sorry, everyone. No, right, okay. So it's a bonus activity, here. Catherine. Bonus activity. Yeah. Brilliant. So we've got a bonus activity here categorised. Now, um, one of the areas that people um, sometimes forget to revise for Changing Economic World is this section about rural areas that are losing population, so depopulation, and rural areas that are growing in population. So what I'd like you to do is see if you can work out which of these statements would be about rural depopulation and which would be about rural population growth. So if you just say for example, you could just say um, depop and then you could just put the numbers down. That'd be brilliant. So let's start the timer. Now, this is so often an area people overlook, so it's really good to have a little look at this because you never know when it's going to pop up. So think about rural areas now. We've been thinking about more of the sort of city, the urban areas, thinking about things like the um, traditional industrial base, but rural areas have also changed and the economies have changed. So let's have a little think about depopulation, things related to population going down, and then think about the rural areas, how in some places the population is growing. All right, so just five seconds left. Oh, well done. Excellent. We've got some answers coming through. Perfect timing. Right, okay. So let's see the answers to this then. Oh, there they go. So rural depopulation, people leaving rural areas, and you can see down the bottom there, a good example is the Orkney Islands. So way up in um, Scotland. Um, People are being pushed out of that area. Think about push and pull factors that we learned about for the urban challenges section. So people are being pushed away from the area because they are um, thinking about the lack of services, things like healthcare, education, and a lack of job opportunities. Now, what tends to happen is that the young people, the working age people tend to move away, leaving the older population behind. And things get worse because you've got people moving away. You lose even more services and even more opportunities. So schools and shops may shut. So think about, you know, you should have looked at an, um, a place where that's happened. And a lot of schools look at the Orkney Islands. But we also have the reverse happening in some rural areas. People are pulled to some rural areas by access to services and opportunities. And an example is South Cambridgeshire. People might move to um, live in rural, beautiful areas of South Cambridgeshire because they might think, yeah, I can live in the countryside, but I can still access things like we're back to the science park again um, in Cambridge because you might maybe commute to work somewhere like that and live in the countryside. So people are being pulled by the access to services and opportunities. But um, this can mean that you get little villages which are um, developing because there's such a demand for people to um, be living there. And that can involve building on greenfield sites. And also, sometimes um, we use this term suburbanisation, where we've got um, smaller villages and towns which are... Um, growing and becoming more urban and sometimes even being swallowed up by um you know expanding urban areas um, people moving out to the edges of the urban areas and it almost becoming like it's part of the 
big town or city. So there's lots of good things about um, rural population growth, but also some people are concerned as well about the impact it can have socially, economically and environmentally. So like I say, this is an area that when people are revising, it often sort of slips past and people don't realise that it's something that's on the specification, but it is worth a look. So let's try again then, handing over for the next activity. Oh, this is definitely me. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> okay. Brilliant. Right. Thank you very much, Catherine. So we're going to be doing a connection wall. Those of you who haven't seen it before, you're going to see 16 phrases and we need to group them into four groups of four and work out what the connection is between them. So here we go. OK, so I'm going to give you a few seconds to just read through, just scan across. And then I'm going to give you your first clue. So the first four I would like you to identify are the things to do with the most common form of transport. So things to do with the most common form of transport. So when you think you found four words, pop them into the chat box. If you are playing at home on catch up, you've got all the time in the world to pause it and see what you reckon. So, but if you're live, you better put your answers in very quick. So four, four terms or four words there that to do with the most common form of transport. <laughs> Thank you, Tutor, to you. It's not horse riding when I last looked. Certainly that's not the way I get to school in the mornings. Some of you might, you never know. <laughs> okay, I've got a couple coming in. So think it's the most common form, it's the most likely one that you use. Right, let's, I think, have the reveal. We'll have to go with the reveal. Okay, so the first one here is road. So you can see here, all these are to do with the road. So we can increase capacity in the condition of our routeways. We've got the Southwest Superhighway, which hopefully will mean um, we can all get down to um, Somerset, Devon and Cornwall much more quickly. Uh, we've got smart motorways, um, which, yeah, I think they change the, um, change the speeds and also you can sometimes drive in the hard shoulder, although I think there's been a few problems with those. And lastly, you can see 2014, there was a road investment strategy. Right, let's speed on. So we've got one lot of four, so the next lot of four. Now, I'm going to give you a clue again to find them. This is one of the oldest forms of transport for the general public. And we've actually got the oldest network in the world, as this was main form of transport was actually invented in the UK in the early 19th century and was the most heavily used transport until the mid 20th century. So there's your clue. So I think I've got an answer coming in, which is almost right. But there's a few. Just have a have a think. What do you think would be the next one? So that clue was the oldest form of transport. So what do you think you might, what four words might you link with that? Remember, we invented it in the UK in the early 19th century. So a bit of history again. Okay, you can pause it if you're at home, but if you're live, let me see your answers. <laughs> yep, you too. There's another clue. Right, shall we go for the answer, please, Jim? Brilliant. So these will rail. So we've got Crossrail there. Crossrail is actually going to run from Heathrow in the west of London across right over far out to the east in Essex. They're laying 180 18 kilometres of new track and I found out the trains are going to be 200 metres long so I'm sure some of you um, have run athletics and you know how long the 100 metres is some of you might have run 200 metres that's how long they're going to be um, twice as long as the tube trains and they can carry a massive 1,500 passengers. They're going to have air conditioning, which is pretty cool, Wi-Fi and 4G. Um, but apparently they're not going to have any toilets in them. Um, we've got HS2 there as well. Very, very contentious. Um, large amounts of environmental damage, destruction of really ancient woodlands in the UK. It's going to cost £106 billion. So some people perhaps think that it might be spent better elsewhere. 
but it's going to mean that you can go from Manchester to London instead of 88 minutes it's only going to take you 40 so that's going to be pretty quick in the time you've watched this uh, you could have got from London to Manchester on HS2 right um, and then we've got electrification and commuting on public transport right let's have our third one and this one okay is to do with i guess i'm gonna say our uh, the fact that we're an island so this is something that suits us because we're an island okay yeah what next road rail have a think what's next okay Let's have some answers. If you're at home, you can pause, work out. You've only got eight left, so it's two lots of four. Right, let's have a reveal, please, Jim. So our next one there are all to do with ports. Okay, so we've got renewable energy sectors, which are just being um, put very close to ports just off offshore. Um, we've got containers and ferries and cruises and Liverpool too. And I just wanted to say a little bit about Liverpool too, because this obviously links with the UK, um, this UK changing economic world syllabus, because we often look at that north-south divide. And what is being done to support and strategies to help the northern regions to um, develop economically to make sure that there isn't such um, inequalities between those two regions. And Liverpool too is a really great example where their government is spending £400 million to invest in a deep water container terminal in Liverpool. Now I'm sure lots of you recently saw the, um, the huge mega container ship which got stuck in the um, Suez Canal and now you're aware of just how large those ships are. So it's it's being built to be able to accommodate those type, type of ships. They're up to about 400 metres long, which of course, if they can um, take all of those very, very large mega container ships, it's really gonna help stimulate economic development in the Northwest. Right, now we've got four left. Pretty obvious, what I'd like you to do is try to tell me what you think links those four white ones. So what do you think links those four white ones? And pop it into chat. If you're at home, you can just have a look, write it down. Yeah, well, well done, Benjamin. You've got it. Right. Let's go for the reveal then, Jim. These indeed are airports. And again, really contentious issue there. Third runway for Heathrow. December 2020, it went to the Supreme Court and a judgment saying it was illegal based on the Paris Climate Agreement. So it'd be interesting to see whether there's any appeals, whether they try to um, still push it through and whether actually post-COVID, do we need to have um, a third runway? Is international travel going to come back in the same quantity as it was before? So who knows? Big question marks over that. Right, I'm going to finish up there and pass on to, I think it's going over to Vicky. It is. Thank you very much. So we have got five true or false questions now. OK, and uh, obviously nice and straightforward this time. So you just need to pop true or false into the chat window. If you need a little bit more time at home, obviously you can pause if you're watching on playback. But this is a pretty speedy round. So our first statement, the North South divide refers to the cultural and economic differences between the North and the South of the UK. These may be real or imagined. So true or false, pop it in the chat window. I'll give you a moment. Okay, we've got some good answers coming through already. And we seem to have quite a sense. Oh, hang on. We've got a lot. I was about to say we have a consensus. Everybody seems to be agreeing it's true. We've got a couple popping in false. Jim, can you reveal the correct answer, please? Super. It is true. So lots of assumptions are made about uh, things like the cost of living, um, even like things like the weather and how friendly people are, etc. Um, there's all sorts of assumptions being made there between that. Divide. But there are there is some evidence that backs it up as well. OK, second question or second statement, please. So all areas areas in the north of the UK are poor and all areas in the south are rich. Again, can we have um, quick answers into the chat window? Already lots of correct answers are coming through. Just give you a moment, get a couple more of you 
popping your answers in. Okay, good, good, good. We seem to have a consensus here. So Jim, can we have the reveal please? Super, it is false. So although there are, we know generally areas in the South tend to be a little bit more wealthy than the uh, North, but there are lots of areas in the North that are like particularly around Manchester where lots of you will be from uh, Cheshire, really expensive. And you've also got some areas in the South which are quite deprived. So for example, Newham in East London, um, Jaywick in Essex, um, particularly deprived. Okay, next statement please, Jim. So many areas which have had a traditional industrial base have fallen into decline while the service sector has boomed in some places. Do we think this is true or false? And interesting, in the chat window, we've got a comment about Cornwall being one of the poorest areas in Europe, which is really interesting. Lots of people find that quite surprising because obviously it looks very beautiful. It's very popular, tour, you know, it's a very popular tourist destination. But generally, as a county, doesn't it, it's quite isolated. It doesn't offer huge amounts of employment potential. It is quite, uh, it is quite poor. OK, so we have lots of answers coming through. And again, everybody is in agreement. So, Jim, can we have the correct answer up? Good. It is true. So generally, some air, sort of urban areas have fared better. So they're, where there's a scope for the service sector, particularly based around leisure and tourism. But you've got some former mining communities um, such as Murphy Tidville in South Wales, which have experienced a bit of a spiral of decline. So you might have sort of come across a negative multiply before, for example, the um, closure of a mine will um, generate mass unemployment, which means there'll be less spending in the local economy, which might lead to further job losses. Therefore, you get a lack of investment, etc, etc. OK, fourth statement, please, Jim. So all of the 24 enterprise zones created since 2011 are in the north of the UK. Is that true or false? So these are areas that are kind of like really trying to promote development and trying to promote really interesting projects and things. What do we think? Are they going to be all in the north of the UK or are they going to be spread about? OK, we have some disagreement coming through in this one. OK, I'll give you a couple more moments. OK, Jim, can we have the reveal for this one, please? Thank you. So it is false. So there are lots of them in the north of the UK, but you've also got many in the south. So, for example, you've got the Aero Hub extension, which is in Cornwall. We've just mentioned Cornwall from just a moment ago about having quite high levels of poverty. You've got the Bristol Temple Quarter, which some of you would have um, looked at because Bristol is a case study in the uh, textbook. And um, the Didcot Growth Accelerator, which is in Oxfordshire. So they are just a few examples of those enterprise zones which are uh, further south. And our last statement for this round is local enterprise partnerships are voluntary and they link local authorities and businesses. So local authorities is just another word like the local council. OK, so local enterprise partnerships are voluntary and link local authorities and businesses. Is that true or is that false? OK, so have a think. Pop your answer really quickly into the chat window. OK, we've got some good answers coming through already. Most people seem to be in agreement here. OK, just give you a couple more moments. OK, well done. Jim, can we have the reveal, please? Thank you. They are. It is true. So these are voluntary. They link authorities and businesses. And there are lots of benefits to local businesses, such as tax breaks, um, more simplified local planning um, sort of processes, making development much, much easier and therefore much more likely to go have an, ahead and have an impact on the local economy. Excellent. If you're not sure, if you're, you know, if you're not really sure what these local enterprise partnerships are, then have a look at them. There's a bit, there's a, um, a UK website that looks at all the different projects and things. There's lots of interesting examples of what they're doing and some really interesting projects that are currently going on around the UK at the moment to stimulate the UK economy. Well done. Some really good answers coming through there. Most of you got all of those right, so great work. Right, I'm going to hand back over to um, Suzanne now for some multiple choice questions. Right, very quick fire. Thank you, Vicky. Um, we're going to whiz through these because these are great um, and quite quick. So this question number one, the country with which the UK did the most trade in 2020 was. So look at that graph. Was it A, Germany, B, the EU, C, the USA, or D, Wales? 
So you're going to have to interpret that graph. So let's see who's going to be the first off to get an answer in. Oh, well done, Madison. Got you, Gabriel. Yeah, Benjamin. Fantastic. Right, let's have the reveal, please, Jim. It is, in fact, the USA. You can see there its value of UK exports is pretty high. Probably well, just under, I would say, 50,000 there. Right, let's go on to question number two. So Southampton is an important transport hub connecting the UK to the wider world through its now. There's a huge clue in front of you from the photo. So is it A, an airport, B, a railway, C, a port, or D, a road network? Hopefully, we'll be able to recognise what you think Southampton is important for. <laughs> Definitely a car park. Brilliant. OK, I can see this one wasn't fooling you, was it? Let's have a reveal, please. OK, it's in fact a port and actually Southampton's got a really large passenger and cargo port. It's the busiest cruise terminal in the whole UK. So this is if people want to go on their posh cruises around the world. Um, this is where most of the boats go from. And it's the second largest container port in the UK after the port of Felixstowe in Suffolk. OK, right. And of course, big famous thing, Titanic. Um, number three, the UK exports its culture to the world. How much had Peppa Pig cartoons earned by 2015? But you might some of you might have to guess with this one. A, do you think it was one billion US dollars? B, one million US dollars? C, half a billion dollars or D, a hundred thousand dollars? So you might have to just give give a bit of a, a guess to this one. OK, I can see some of actually guessing correctly. Maybe, you know, <laughs> maybe you're big pepper, pepper pig export um, people. Right. Can I have the uh, reveal, please, Jim? OK, so actually one billion US dollars. Um, so a bit of a money spinner for the UK, although I found out recently that China has blocked the online um, content of pepper pig as it promotes apparently gangster subculture. <laughs> Very confusing. I just thought I just thought it was a cartoon about a pig. Anyway, question number four, please. How many countries are there in the Commonwealth? Okay, so is it A fifty one, B fifty three, C fifty two, or D fifty four? Remember, the Commonwealth is the international association, which consists of the UK together with the states that were part of the British Empire and its dependencies. So. This one, you're either going to know it or you don't. So pop it down in the chat. I've got, I think, oh, I've got quite a few correct answers coming in. So let's see, Jim. Oh, that was a nice sound. Uh, 54. OK, so that's the answer. There's 54 um, states and dependencies. Right. And our very final question. Oh, no, second to final question. The head of state of Australia. Is it A, her, uh, His Royal Highness Prince Charles? Is it the Honourable Scott Morrison MP? The C, the Honourable Anthony Albanese MP? Or is it D, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II? See if you can work out. I can see. Great. I can see some people already coming in with the correct answer. Fab, Jim, can you show us, please? It is, in fact, um, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. And I always get very jealous because they get a public holiday on her birthday. So they get a day off school or a day off work when it's the Queen's birthday. And we don't, which I feel like maybe I've missed out there. Right, question number six, final one. When did the UK exit from the EU? So this should be very difficult. A, the 31st of December 2020. B, the 31st of January 2020, C, the 23rd of June 2016, or D, the 1st of January 1973. It's a very long time ago. Pop down when you think it was. I've got a few mix here, mix of answers. If you're playing at home on catch up, see if you can think where you, where you were, what you were doing when you found out we'd exited. Right, let's go with the reveal then, please, Jim. So it was 31st of January 2020, so not so long ago. OK, um, right. I will pass back over to Catherine, who's going to take you through the last section.
Just just to mention briefly, the other dates that were in that last question there all had um, different relevance as well. But um, one of them was when we joined the EU, one was when the vote was held and one was when the transition period ended. So, um, you know, there's lots of different things to think about with the whole Brexit situation. Um, and it's going to be an interesting one to see how it develops in the future. And that links in with what um, we've got on the screen now, this example. Um, you need to know an example of how industrial development can be more environmentally sustainable. Now, one of the textbooks includes um, the Nissan plant in Sunderland as an example of an industry and looking at um, you know, issues that it may be facing with sustainability and how it can be more environmentally sustainable. And one of the interesting things about this Nissan plant linking to the European Union is Nissan has recently um, reasserted that it will be staying committed to being based in Sunderland, even though in the past there was some discussion about, you know, would it be concerned about um, leaving the European Union with England leaving the EU, um, UK leaving the EU, um, but it has reaffirmed its commitment. So you may not have studied Nissan, you may have studied um, another textbook has Tor Quarry. Um, some people that study Bristol Temple Quarter might have looked at the paintworks example from there, but you should have an example of an industrial development, thinking about the issues that it faces and how it can be more environmentally sustainable. So I think that brings us to the end of the session. Wow, fantastic. What a whistle-stop tour <laughs> of uh, what's our second week, is it, on Changing Economic World. And we got yeah, some Pepper Pig, some pepper pig in there as well. Some Pepper Pig. I, I, I heard a rumour that uh, Pepper Pig um, prefers GCSE geography to GCSE history. Absolutely. Uh, because in GCSE history, <laughs> she, gets, she gets set to uh, too much handwork. Yeah. Oh dear. Um, but that's 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 hogwash. So ignore that. <laughs> Fantastic session. Brilliant. And uh, a huge thanks to Catherine for putting that session together and for leading it uh, and for joining us bang on time just with the traffic. So, clearing so sorry. So sorry about the rush at the start. Oh, Thank fine. you everybody for your patience with me. It all it all adds to the uh, to the live authenticity. Fantastic stuff. Brilliant session. <laughs> and of course to Suzanne and Vicky as well. Uh, our three three of our regulars on this this amazing GCSE geography uh, team and our series of live sessions. Hopefully, you found it useful. If you did, and you're watching live or on replay, uh, give us a thumbs up on YouTube because that helps suggest and recommend this type of content to others. And uh, like it if you're watching on Facebook Live or catching up on Facebook. That'd be great as well. Uh, well, we've got a whole archive of other topics to work through. Uh, for GCSE Geography. If you go to cheatertnet forward slash live, you can go through a replay of not only this session, but the previous 11 sessions. Download the PowerPoints as well, maybe, to look through if there's a particular topic you want to catch up on. It sounds like that's, that sound is the sound of somebody else trying to join in for our next subject, our next session. So we'll have to wrap it up there. Uh, huge thanks to Catherine, Vicky, and from Suzanne, and from myself. Bye. We'll catch you later. See you later. Bye. Bye.